Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the, the card. And these life books really are amazing. Um, we've given these out before, and they go through, and it's like a dialogue. And so you have sort of the skeptic, and you have the, the person who, who knows the Bible. You have somebody that's just searching and, and seeking, and you've got those kind of dialogues in here in these life books. And you can pick it up, read it. The dialogue is there, but the entire Gospel of John is contained in this book. Uh, with little notes and, and commentaries on what this means. And when Jesus said this, what did he mean? Fantastic. So thank you very much for, for that. Um, today's message is called Melchizedek, a priest of God Most High. And as you're turning to Hebrews chapter 7, um, I invite you to, uh, to understand that this morning, there are certain figures in the Old Testament that you'll read about that just stand out from the crowd. There's certain stories that, that you'll see they just say, man, that is, you read it again, you say, no, that didn't just happen. And you say, oh, yes, it did. All right. And so um, as we're kind of nearing this week of Passover, I thought it would be good for us to look at this Melchizedek, see who he was, what did he do, and why in the world is there a whole chapter in the New Testament dedicated to this man. So please stand up at the reading of God's word, and we're going to see that even a small passage can give a great truth in the scriptures about who Jesus is and what he is for this world. So let's read, starting in verse 1, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings, and Abraham gave him a tenth, he gave him a tithe of everything, First, his name means king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tithe from the people, that is, from their own brothers, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected tithes from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will die received a tithe, but in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tithe, has paid a tithe through Abraham. For he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. If then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must be a change of the law as well. For the one these things are spoken about belong to a different tribe. No one from it has served at the altar. Now it is evident that our Lord, that's Jesus, it's evident that our, our Lord came from Judah. And Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priests. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears who did not become a priest based on a legal command concerning the physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So the previous command is annulled because it was weak and unprofitable. For the law perfected nothing, but a better hope is introduced, through which we draw near to God. None of this happened without an oath. For others became priests without an oath, but he became a priest with an oath, made by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn, and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. So Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now many have become Levitical priests since they are prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he remains forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he will always be able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest we need, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as the high priests do, 
first for their own sins, then for the ones of the people. He did this once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you that in it, you give us this figure, this character that we can study and look at and read and see a picture of who you are and what you're all about. Father, I pray that those that hear this morning, that they would hear the truth in your word. God, whatever things we came into your house with this morning, stress, drama, concerns, Father, I pray that you would pierce right through those things as you say your word is a sword. God, I pray you cut through all of it and get to the hearts of the people, the men and women and children that are here this morning, and let them hear what you have for them today. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is this idea that we have a priestly king here in the Old Testament. I know we just read the, the New Testament, but we're going to get to that. But what we see in verse 1, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. So let's go, let's look in Genesis chapter 14 where it references this Melchizedek. And let's see what does the scripture say. It says, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God Most High. He blessed him and said, Abram is blessed by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and I give praise to God Most High, who has handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth, read, that's a tithe, of everything. So here the New Testament tells us we have the king of righteousness, that's what his, his name means, and then he was king of Salem, or Shalom, and that means peace. So he's the king of righteousness and the king of peace comes and he brings bread and wine. Does that ring a bell? See, what we're seeing here is God was, was beginning to teach his people that there was going to be something more. That what they understood about the law, there's more to it than that. And so we go on. Verse 3, it says, without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. See, we really have no other record outside of Genesis of, of where this guy came from, Melchizedek. We have no record that he ever died or, or any of those things. We don't know what his lineage was. And yet here in Hebrews, it says, we see the author tells us that this man resembles, and literally that word resembles, it means it was modeled after the Son of God. His priesthood didn't come from the law. It came, it was modeled after the Son of God. So we have a priestly king. So not only is he a king, but it says he's a priest of God Most High. So we have somebody acting in a religious sense and somebody acting in, in a political sense of leadership. So that's first, first and foremost. He comes and brings bread and wine. Does that sound like the Lord's Supper? You bet it does. But let's go on, let's move on. He had priestly duties. Okay, so you have the king of righteousness, the king of peace, comes and brings bread. And what was he doing? Look at the priestly duties he was, he was performing. It says, now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tithe of the plunder to him. Let me, let me put this into perspective, okay? You have the three major world religions in the world today, right? The world, the world. You have Judaism, you have Islam, and you have Christianity, all three of them refer to Abraham as Father Abraham. He's, he's the father of the nations. Whether you follow, follow Isaac or Ishmael, they all come from Abraham. Everybody recognizes Abraham, okay? Billions of people in the world. But here's the thing. They have to reconcile what in the world to do with Melchizedek. See, for the, for the person that follows Judaism, you have to say, well, why in the world does Father Abraham tithe to another man. This was, this was the most spiritually renowned person. This was the one that God came to and said, I'm going to bless all nations through you. And yet here's a man we have no record of. Abram comes up to him and gives him a tithe. Judaism has no answer for that. And if you read their commentaries, it's like it's laughable what they say. 
And then you go to Islam, where there is no sacrificial system. There is no sense of a high priest. You have Muhammad. He's not a high priest. And yet Muhammad, through Abraham, tithed this man. What's their answer for it? There, there are no commentaries. Because what do you do with a person who's greater than Abraham that you have no answer for? Well, you go to the scriptures. The Bible tells us exactly who he was. Look at verse 5. It says, The sons of Levi who received the priestly office have a command to collect a tithe, right? So Levi descended from Aaron, who is Moses' brother. And the law says, yeah, in, in Exodus 29, it says, Tie the sashes of Aaron and his sons, fasten headbands on them. The priesthood is to be theirs by a permanent statue. Statute. So you have that in Exodus 29. Okay, this is permanent. They, these guys were going to be the priests, the, the earthly priests. So again, how is it possible that certain men were commanded to collect a tithe from their brothers, and yet they all came from Abraham, who tithed another? That wasn't part of his lineage. It says, but one without lineage collects tithes. And you see, we see that, we see here that Melchizedek, he not only collected a tithe, look at that verse there, it says, and blessed the one who had the promises. So why in the world was he blessing Abram as well? What, what spiritual authority did Melchizedek have to bless the one who had the promise from God to be the blessing to the world? Because God had something greater. God had something bigger he was going to do, and he just get look at this, a blip. It's like three verses. It's a blip in the Old Testament that God says, yeah, by the way, there's a bigger plan here. There's something bigger going on than you human beings. It's bigger. So it says that they are blessed, and if we continue, it just gets more and more interesting. Look at verse 7. It says, without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. You know, one of the most nerve-wracking things that a young man can do is go to his girlfriend's dad and ask for the daughter's hand in marriage. Nerve-wracking. And, and for you young ladies out there, uh, you need to be dating the kind of guy that has the honor and respect to do that to begin with. But see, really, this is a modern version of the blessing. Because I'll tell you this much, I'm not going door to door asking if somebody will marry my daughters. Nope. The inferior is blessed by the superior. You go to the father and you're essentially asking for the blessing for that marriage. Will you, will you put your blessing on this marriage? Can I marry your daughter? Not the other way around. And yet here we see Abram is blessed by Melchizedek. Verse 8, it says, In the one case, the one men who will die receive tithes, but in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. All right, so picture this. The, the Levitical priests were collecting tithes from Israel, and yet they would eventually die, right? Okay, the priests died. Okay, everybody understands that, right? This is not too deep there, okay? They died. But there's no story of Melchizedek ever dying. And so the author is setting up an eternal truth about the priesthood structure of the Old Covenant. And so he says in verse 9, he says, In a sense, Levi himself received a tithe and paid tithes through Abraham. He was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now this was written a couple thousand years before Jesus was born. And then it would still be another couple thousand years before DNA was discovered. But here you have a, a genetic truth about the reality of DNA. Because you have the genes that are passed on from Abraham down through Levi, down through Aaron, right? Down through, down through all them. Aaron and Levi. You know which one I'm talking about. And so in the genetic sense, Levi was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. And so the high priest paid a tithe to another higher priest. But let's look at the priestly order. So those are the things he was doing. He was collecting a tithe as a priest. Let's look at the priestly order. It says, verse 11, If then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, what further need was there for another priest to appear? Now the wording here, if you read this whole thing, the wording might be confusing, and so you can, you can ask it this way. And we're going to kind of break it down. If the Levitical priesthood of the old law could produce perfection, then why do we need another priesthood? Only if the Levitical priesthood in the old law could produce perfection would, would there be an issue. Okay, so if the old way worked, there wouldn't be an issue. 
but it didn't work, and therefore we have an issue, it couldn't produce perfection. And look at verse 12, it says, for when there's a change of priesthood, there must be a change of law. The goal of God is perfection. And so many get this wrong. So many people view God in the wrong way and not the way that he reveals himself to be. God wants perfection in every single one of us. And the scripture reveals that over and over and over again. And when we look at the law, we talked about this last week, when you look at the commandments, that's not for us to go through and see how how great of a job we're doing. It's so that we can see we are not perfect. We are sinners. The fact that there was a problem is that there had to be a change in the law. In every way, shape, or form, God has revealed to mankind that we are not perfect. And so he established a priesthood as a picture of what was to come. We understand something had to change. And when the priesthood changed, so did the rules. That's why it says, verse 13, The one these things are spoken about belonged to a different tribe. No one from it had ever served at the altar. Melchizedek belonged to a different tribe, and it's real basic math. Melchizedek met Abraham. All the tribes were after Abraham. So obviously he wasn't part of that tribe. Everybody follow that, right, the math? Okay. Here was a guy, completely different tribe, didn't belong to it at all, and yet collecting tithes and blessings. So you have to ask yourself, how was there a priest before God commanded that there be a priest? It says he was already a priest of the Most High God. How is this possible if you don't have the law until years later given to Moses when he says, okay, you need to have a priest? How do we have that? How is there a priesthood before God commands that there's a priest? There's something eternal going on here. So move on. It says, it's evident that Jesus, our Lord, came from Judah. And Moses said nothing about that. We know that Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. And the tribe tribe of Judah had no priesthood in the old law. So what is his priesthood based on? Look at verse 15. And this becomes clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears who did not become a priest based on a legal command concerning physical descent, but based on the power of what? An indestructible life. Yeah, things should be getting real clear about who this Melchizedek was. Things should be getting real clear about what he represented. Jesus was not a priest because God had declared something great and righteous about his human descent. Humanity is completely taken off the picture. There's nothing about humans that God is relying on to save anybody in this church. It's in God alone. And so that's why he says it becomes more clear. That's why we have this priest who has nothing to do with earthly lineage. He's a priest by the power of an indestructible life. It says, verse 17, it's been testified, you're a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, here's something awesome. This is a quote from uh, from Psalm 110, all right? This is a quote, direct quote, you're a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What's awesome is that this is the exact same psalm that Jesus uses when he's talking to the teachers of the law, and he brings up this point. He says, okay, tell me this. Can you tell me why David, right, who wrote the psalm, can you tell me why David said, the Lord said to my Lord, Can you explain to me why that would happen? Because they knew that Psalm 110 was was talking about the Messiah. So here's the picture. Why is David calling his son Lord? Why was David calling his own son, who would be the Messiah, you know, down the road, why did he call him master? Why did he, and the wording in the the Old Testament is, Yahweh said to my Lord. He's He's equating the Messiah with Yahweh God. He's saying, why does David call his own son Lord? And, of course, the Pharisees and the teachers, they don't uh, don't, know. Good question, Jesus. Jesus is quoting that psalm when he goes down. And and the the scriptures are quoting, he quotes that psalm. And then Hebrews quotes the same psalm when it says this about Melchizedek. He's a priest forever. So, in other words, the same verse that Jesus uses to establish and say, look, the Messiah is God, is the same one that the author of Hebrews says, yeah, the Messiah is God. So let's keep going. It says he's a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. See, God didn't make Jesus, God didn't make the priests, and he didn't model it after, after a human. The priesthood was modeled after the Son of God. 
because Jesus is that eternal priest. Look at verse 18. It says, so the previous command was annulled because it was weak and unprofitable. Where's the high priest of the Levitical law today? Can anybody tell me? Where is the high priest of the Levitical law? Who do the Jews say is the high priest? There isn't one. The temple's gone. He would just be standing on rubble. He he would have nothing to go on, nothing to do. It says that that it was weak and unprofitable. The temple was destroyed. Uh, Josephus is the historian. He gives the name of the last known high priest. That guy wasn't even a Levite. It was just a layman standing in the place of, of the high priest. It had become political. It had become a wreck. There is no high priest today under the Levitical law. The Jews have completely lost sight and track of who that person may be. Do you know why that is? Because it was done. Something new, something better came along. His name is Jesus. He is our great high priest. He is the one that's able to forever perform for us, which we're going to get into. It says a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. The better hope that's introduced is Jesus Christ. Because of him, we can actually draw near to God. Did you know God doesn't want you walking around this earth hoping that he's there? You know God doesn't want you walking around this earth feeling like you've got to figure it out? Did you know that God doesn't want you walking this earth trying to do your best to make your way into heaven? That's not our God. He sent us a better hope in Jesus Christ. And that means we can have a relationship today. Look at this. Finally, priestly perfection. It says, none of this happened without an, without an oath. Verse 21, it says, he became a high priest with an oath and made by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn. See, when God swears an oath, there's no taking it back. And we've said that, right? God doesn't change his mind. God said to the Messiah, forever you are a priest like Melchizedek. And God never swore any oath about an earthly priest. It says, Jesus became the guarantee. Look at verse 22. Jesus has also become the guarantee of a better covenant. This is what all the verses are getting to. It's a guarantee. There's a lot of religions in the world. There's a lot of beliefs. There are no guarantees outside of Jesus Christ. There's no human guarantee. There's no religious guarantee. All the religions basically say you do your best, you work your best, and God will either show his favor or he won't. That's appeasement. Remember, we talked about that. That's appeasing an angry God. This is a guarantee. What good is a man's word compared to the word of the living God? What good is a human certificate? You know, I bought a truck a few years ago, a couple years ago. It was a beautiful red Tundra. It was beautiful. And it was certified, Toyota, Toyota certified used. Beautiful red Tundra. And I was driving that beautiful red Tundra, and the wheel was like this. I was like, I got my truck. I got a good deal. And it was raining. And I heard a noise like in the center and the top. And I was like, what's that? And I pushed up and just a gush of water flowed into my truck. And I prayed for it to stop. It did not stop. So I took it to the mechanic. And and it was a dealership. He said, said, "Uh, I can't work on this. He said, this has been in like a terrible wreck. And I said, you got to be kidding me. Now, I had seen the Carfax at the dealership that said, no wrecks, clean, background, all that, certified, Toyota certified, good. So I went back to the dealer, showed them the real Carfax that was online, showed them that the one that they showed me was doctored, and they gave me a great deal. (laughs) What can we do for you, Mr. McCord? He can fix that red truck. (laughs) Let me tell you something. The only guarantee that you can die on is the guarantee of Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that he became the guarantee of a better covenant. Do you know why your soul longs for eternity? 
Do you know why the richest people in the world take drugs and kill themselves and just want more and more money and more and more stuff? You know why that's true? Because there is no guarantee outside of Jesus Christ. Fill it with whatever you want. Fill it with stuff. Fill it with fame. Fill it with money. Fill it with talent. Fill it with all the gods of this world. There is no guarantee outside of Jesus Christ. What are you going to do when you come face to face with God? And on one side, there's going to be the blood of Jesus Christ covering people who are getting into heaven. People who have put their faith in his work on the cross. That'll be on one side. And then you're going to have what? Your best? Your certification? By the way, when you stand before God, it says you will be naked before him. So all that stuff you've been building up this life, pfft, bye. You're now naked in front of God. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd have all my stuff. This kind of didn't work out the way I was hoping. Um, that's the reality. That's the testimony of people who have died and come back. They say, yeah, uh, I don't know, you know everything that was going on, but I know Jesus was in charge. Awesome movie coming out. Heaven is for real. Be coming out in a little bit. The book will blow your mind. The testimony is, we don't know what's going on up there, but we know Jesus is in charge. There is no guarantee outside of God. Let's go down to verse 26. It says, for this, kind of, this is the kind of high priest we need. And I want you to think, just take a mental image and think about yourself Think about whatever it is that you've put your faith in up to this point, and I want you to compare it to this. Is it holy? In other words, if you've been hoping that you do your best and your works are going to get you into heaven, are you holy? Are you innocent? Never done anything wrong? Raise your hand. Didn't think so. All right. Are you undefiled? Have you not put your body and your mind in places they should not have been? Guilty as charged. Are you separated from sinners? Are you exalted above the heavens? If you thought you were doing good up till then. <laughs> I want you to picture the most beautiful, awesome thing you can. Just imagine the most beautiful, awesome thing you can. Imagine heaven, what heaven might be like. And I want you to realize that Jesus Christ is even better and greater than that. He is exalted above the heavens. In verse 27, he doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day. He says he did this once for all when he offered himself. See, sin requires death. Uh, if you don't believe it, there's a graveyard. I invite you to go out and see the proof. We die because there is sin in this world. The high priest uh, would then come and offer a lamb. For, the, for Israel, because sin required death, so they would sacrifice a lamb. And that's why when Jesus came onto the scene, John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, here is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's what they said about Jesus when he came into this world. He is so much better and so much more awesome than we are. Jesus offered himself one time because that's all it took for God to defeat sin. He was tortured he went up on the cross, he bled, and he died. But he took your sin on the cross. Not just the sin of your neighbors. I want you to understand this. Your sin, those things that are deep, dark secrets that you hope nobody finds out. Yeah, he died for that too. He took your sin on the cross and he died because sin requires death. He became our lamb. But then three days later, he did what no lamb and what no human does. He came back to life. And when he came back to life, he said, yeah, I am everything that God has been telling you that I am. I am a priest forever. I am God eternal. I am the most high God. I am exalted above everything. Jesus alone can say those things because he did it. He came and he died and look at verse 28. It says, The law appoints as high priests men who are weak. But the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. Jesus proved that he alone is the son 
of the living God and that he was perfected forever when he died on the cross and came back to life. And here we have this little blip, this little glimpse in the Old Testament of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, bringing bread and wine, God giving a picture and saying there's more to this story than maybe you gave credit. In a second here, we're going to have an invitation. If you know that you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never put your faith and your trust in the Son of God for your salvation and for your sin, we invite you to come up and we'd love to talk to you about it. If you have accepted Christ and you have not been baptized by immersion and you know that God has put it on your heart that this is the day and this is what you should be doing, we invite you to come forward. If you would like to become a member of Conowingo Baptist Church, please come forward and, and I'd love to talk to you about it. But whatever God lays on your heart, I ask that you do that after we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for your word. And yes, God, I know it's tough to be obedient to you. It's tough to look ourselves over and say, yeah, I, I am a sinner. I've done a lot of things against God. It's tough to say that. It's tough to admit it. And Father, it's even harder when it comes time to come forward to stand up and, and step out and say, yeah, you know, I, I have not been obedient. I need Jesus in my life. That's, that's tough. But Father, there is no greater joy on the side of heaven than when we turn to you and say, I've sinned against a holy God. I'm done trying to do my best and trying to, trying to live the part. I'm not going to fake it anymore. I, I need Jesus in my heart. God, I believe that anybody who has not accepted Christ knows it because the Holy Spirit doesn't live inside of them. I pray that as we start this invitation time, that you would move those, get those that need to stand up and come out of the pew and come forward. I pray that you would give them courage. If there's people around them that know they need to go, Father, help them to give them a hand and say, I'll go with you. You just be obedient to what God's calling you to do. Father, I pray for a blessing on this time that you would work in the lives of the people and help us to listen and to receive a holy and innocent and righteous God into our hearts. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.